Okay, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I'm the interim director of NITEX, which is the National Institute for Theoretical and Computational Sciences. And this afternoon, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Adriana Mare, <clears throat> because uh, Adriana and I go back many, many moons. <laughs> yeah, because Adriana did her master's with me, her PhD with me, her postdoc with me. So we did lots of uh, sense and nonsense together <laughs> over, over the years. Yeah? But um, <clears throat> as you probably saw in the announcement, Adriana is involved with uh, many space-related issues. Yeah, She wants to go to Mars. Yeah? She has a foundation <clears throat> yeah? that uh, also promotes uh, Africa to go to the moon. Yeah, Of course, no African has been on the moon. And I see here two, two candidates. <laughs> so you have to pay attention, <laughs> yeah, and um, and many other things that I won't list now. Yeah, <clears throat> but today is a special day because we started this morning uh, a NITEX research workshop on, on biophotons, which is something very exciting that has been around for hundred years, <clears throat> and hopefully will pick up on relevance after this workshop. <laughs> yeah. So that's why we we are here, and and Adriana will will share everything about it. And hopefully also something about Mars, yeah, for the <laughs> for the benefit of the of the younger the younger generation here. Yeah, Adriana, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesco. Good evening, everyone. So I should be really nervous because I'm giving a entry level talk to a topic where we actually are really delighted to have the world's leading experts on the topic in the room. So uh, I'm not nervous because I've decided to talk for half the session and the other half, we can open up the discussion with the relevant experts in the room um, or we can hear what was wrong about the first 30 minutes in my talk about the topic. <laughs> so yeah, we are hosting um, a century of bio photons workshop um, thanks to Nethex and our funding also from the Guy Foundation this week here in Stellenbosch. So we've just had day one of the conference today and we'll continue tomorrow. And after that, we will upload some of the talks from the conference. So in case you are interested with this introductory level talk, um, the more technical uh, detailed talks will be available afterwards. So um, I will explain uh, these images and what the onion has to do with it um, as we go. But as a bit of background, um, my PhD with Francesco was in quantum biology. And at that time in, in 2011, when I was just embarking on the project, Quantum biology was a relatively, well, some would argue not new field, but let's say there was a resurgence and in interest in the field of quantum biology. And there are some interesting characters all in one place here. Maybe you can recognize Bethany and I and Francesco. And um, there's Seth Lloyd, Flacco Fedral, um, and a, a bunch of other players in quantum biology. So this was, this was quite early days for the resurgence and in interest in quantum biology. And we were already with Francesco hosting um, workshops, schools, and uh, conferences on the topic in Durban at the time. Um, so then in 2014, we held a slightly smaller discussion workshop where we debated the, the history, but more importantly, the future. So the opportunities and challenges for the field um, at a, a beautiful location was at Tula Tula. Um, and uh, out of this discussion workshop, we published an article on the future of quantum biology. And we thought this model worked quite nicely. So we are repeating the model here uh, this week with the topic of biophotons with a view to, um, we, have, we, have, we are delighted that the, the people we have invited have traveled all the way here to attend our workshop. And uh, I'll show a family tree of biophotons in a moment to show um, the lineages from which many of the speakers come in terms of the topic. Um, but uh, through publishing an article based on this workshop, we hope to broaden the tree, but also strengthen the ties between the various players um, in the field um, through through this gathering here. So it's really special for us to have have all of the, most of you in the audience um, here this week. And for those not part of the workshop, um, yeah, there should be an introduction. So let's let's go. What what are biophotons? So um, I always have to go back to the beginning. Where's Pavel He also had to go back to the beginning. So um, light tells us about matter. And even as far back as we can go to the origins of the universe, uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation tells us about the state of the early universe, the 
predominantly hydrogen that was present at the time. So this is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, small amounts of helium. Um, but in fact, the, the spin transitions within those hydrogen atoms travel through time to give us information about the early matter in the universe. So again, we are looking at light to infer matter-matter interactions. And this is another story for another day, but in fact, we are with the Foundation for Space Development Africa that Francesco mentioned, building a radio telescope to deploy on the far side of the moon, which will actually be the a location where we can detect signals between um, about one and 10 megahertz for the first time, because the ionosphere of the atmosphere of Earth reflects signals of this frequency band. So if we're talking about unexplored parts of the universe, in fact, this frequency band is the, one of the last, with respect to the electromagnetic spectrum, one of the last unexplored realms of the universe. And the far side of the moon is a quiet place to perform such measurements because we shield the um, human-made radio interference from the Earth, as well as the natural radiation that the Earth emits from this unique location in the solar system. So again, looking for light to infer details about the state of the matter from where it originates. So we can't um, have a talk on, on light and matter without mentioning the Square Kilometre Array Radio Telescope. So as South Africans, we're really proud to be hosting um, the part of the SKA here in the Northern Cape. So the Meerkat Array, which is 64 dishes, um, has already been completed in the Northern Cape. And this, was, this is some of the research that's already come out of this precursor um, of what will become the Square Kilometre Array Radio Telescope in around 10 years, along with other infrastructure that's being built in Western Australia. And this is actually a picture of the centre of the Milky Way, so the um, contrast is inverted. That's the supermassive black hole, the light part in the middle. And the reason I put the slide here is that the kind of balloon-like structures to the left and at the bottom are in fact supernova remnants. And from the hydrogen to get the rest of the periodic table that's required to form eventual life, we need supernova events to, to produce these kinds of elements. And this is a beautiful picture, again, through light, understanding the history of matter in the universe. So around about perhaps as long as 4 billion years ago, we know that life emerged in at least one place in the universe, and that is Earth. And these are some of the oldest known fossilized structures that indicate ancient life. These are stromalites. Um, Western Australia is a, a primary region where these are found, going back to three point something billion years ago. And cyanobacteria and actually colonies of other kinds of microbes formed these structures and they were moving towards the light um, out of the water. So this gives evidence for a ocean-based origin of life, as well as the fact that the most early, early life forms appear to have utilized sunlight directly to power the uh, cellular processes. Um, and while we're on the topic of four billion years ago on Earth, um, we can talk about the oxygenation of the atmosphere because those same cyanobacteria um, around two billion years ago had produced enough oxygen to oxygenate the atmosphere. So prior to two billion years ago, in early Earth, there was only traces amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And some of our work during my PhD was indeed on protective mechanisms against uh, reactive oxygen species because the prevalence of oxygen in the atmosphere was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, um, it enabled the development of multicellular life, so organisms like us that breathe air, uh, oxygen in the air, and use oxygen to assist metabolic processes. Um, but on the flip side, there are many species of radical oxygen molecules that can damage cellular structures and so protective mechanisms were um, developed or evolved in the creatures that survived the oxygenation event um, in order to deal with these highly reactive molecules. Um, so in particular, we looked at the reaction center of photosynthetic uh, bacteria, a structure which has prevailed in the four billion year history of life. So presumably it's fairly efficient and robust in doing its job. Um, and we looked at how uh, endogenous magnetic fields can actually suppress triplet formation um, but I don't, won't go into too much detail on that, but protective mechanisms against these oxygen species are uh, essential for living systems to prevail in this newly oxygenated atmosphere. So we've talked a bit about how light can give us information on the early universe, the emergence of structures like galaxies and eventually life in at least one place on Earth, at least one place in the universe here on Earth. 
Um, and the history of light therapy, in fact, goes goes back a long time. I don't know the exact dates on this, but ancient Egypt um, crystals were used to uh, to get light in different uh, frequencies, different colors, um, for different therapeutic applications um, as far back as thousands of years ago, which were believed to be able to penetrate the body and, and treat ailments. And in fact, uh, as far back as 1896, we see Niels Finson's uh, Medical Light Institute using apparatus um, where light was used for therapeutic applications. Um, and in fact, he won the Nobel Prize in 1903 for light therapy. Um, so we may imagine that in the past century, we would have made significant leaps in our uh, applications of light as a form of healthcare therapy. Um, is that the case? Um, let's see. So the reason we are celebrating a century of biophotons and I suppose it takes an outsider to the field to just casually use the word biophoton because we had a long debate this morning um, about the different ways that we can define uh, biophotons. So um, ultra weak photon emission is one um, and various other uh, autoluminescence or chemo chemoluminescence in the biological context are, are other definitions. Um, but Alexander Gerwich was the, the first to propose that there is some kind of non-chemical signaling between uh, intracellular or intercellular, between um, objects or between biological organisms. Um, and the experiment was performed and published first in 1923. So here we sit 100 years later, um, looking at the history of biophotons. So mitogenic radiation being another name um, for this radiation that he proposed. So. What do onions have to do with it? And so our, our sponsor, the Guy Foundation, actually ran a competition this year um, on, uh, on trying to reproduce this experiment and actually measure the non-chemical communication that was uh, proposed to be happening between the roots of these onions. Um, so here, and we've heard, we've heard in detail from Ilya this morning, so if anyone has questions on this, we will uh, direct them um, to, to Ilya, who in fact studied with the grandson of Alexander Goh, which did his PhD, so there's a direct link there. So let me not uh, say too much about this, except that through, through various partitioning, um, these experiments showed that there was some kind of interaction, some stimulation of growth of cell division um, of mitosis in an onion root in the presence of another onion root connected to a bulb which was alive. So um, putting you know barriers in between the two to ensure that no kind of molecular or electric or chemical interaction is going on uh, led Alexander Gerwich to uh, to conclude that there must be some kind of electromagnetic interaction going on between and hence the, the word biophotons because this is ultra weak so difficult to detect especially back in 1923 with the developments we've seen nowadays with the photomultiplier tubes and CCD devices, we can uh, get more sensitivity on these measurements, um, but this was the, the early days. So in order to understand potential sort of mechanisms of how this would take place between biomolecules inside the cell or between cells or between organisms even, uh, required an understanding of, of light and matter on a reduced level, on a more fundamental level, and quantum biology, I've said it's not necessarily a new field. There were ultra-fast experiments performed in 2007, mainly there's one um, nature paper that measured quantum coherence at 77 Kelvin. Okay, then a subsequent experiment had to measure it at room temperature. Um, this was the resurgence of interest in quantum biology, I would say, from the beginning of the century. Um, but the idea and the concepts that result in quantum biology are, of course, not, not new. Um, the photoelectric effect being fundamental, of course, in understanding the um, quantum nature of light itself and how photons interact with matter. Um, Niels Bohr had even given a lecture on light and life um, back in 1932. Um, and Schrodinger also made fundamental contributions, not only to quantum physics, obviously, but also to quantum biology, predicting the existence of, uh, of ge genetics and DNA as a, as a crystal that can take information and transfer it through generations. So all of these people um, won Nobel Prizes for their work. And so again, in the 100 years since these articles, we may think quantum biology has enjoyed a lot of successes, but is this the case? Um, 
and what may be the reason for following other potential avenues of investigation around um, medical therapy in general or our understanding of biology in general. Um, and it has been argued by some of our speakers today that, that uh, this was Pavel also, I think that we had we had a lot of uh, electric interactions um, for communication within or between or between organisms um, and cells. Um, Galvani's uh, experiments of the seventh, 17, of 17, late 1700s um, that inspired Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where you know life is uh, electric, electrocuted into various uh, tissues. Um, and Pasteur, of course, coming up with the germ theory, um, led to impressive progress in terms of sort of molecular carriers of, of communication signals as well as electric carriers of communication signals. And the successes of these uh, fields of investigation meant perhaps that the, the light-based communication between living systems was um, yeah, not as predominant perhaps as these types. So as I've mentioned, um, the experimental apparatus has uh, improved significantly. We have seen beautiful videos uh, from Masaki Kobayashi, who has uh, been working in the field for, for many years, um, and really, really beautiful videos we saw today. For example, metamorphosis uh, from pupa to butterfly and the different emissions that are associated with that process. So we are seeing really beautiful images being produced nowadays. Um, but after, after Alexander Gerwich's proposal of, of biophotons back in the 20s, it took some time before improvements in technologies enabled verification of, of his proposals. And there are some of the groups that did that. So what, what are biophotons? And that's kind of what we are here to discuss at the workshop. So I hope these points are minimal and not incorrect. Um, <laughs> So yes, these are low intensity, we've said diff difficult to detect, um, spontaneous emissions from metabolic type processes, which can be associated with oxidative processes and interactions with uh, oxygen, radical oxygen species. So the questions we are looking at is really to pin down the, the bio biological origins of, of these photons that are coming out of all, it appears, living systems, um, and to think about applications of this. So. If the emissions from a body um, give an indication of the health of that organism, um, can we use them for diagnosis if we have a good understanding? Can we use pattern recognition or machine learning, um, as Edward von Weyck has pointed out, uh, to, to look at the perhaps more individualized healthcare, um, perhaps preventative healthcare by uh, detecting you know, irregularities before they develop into disease? And if we go a step further, can we reverse engineer the radiation that we see coming off biological organisms in order to deliver some kind of therapy um, could be another potential avenue um, in the future. So um, let's discuss more about this with, with people who know more than me, but uh, I hope this is a minimal correct description. So here I have a video. And I'm not going to play the sound because there is some swearing in this video, so I thought it's not great for the Nethex YouTube channel. So, <laughs> But this movie is called Elysium. And actually, they, they're swearing in South African accents. So I thought it was funny, but maybe, maybe inappropriate. But if you haven't seen this movie, it's got a South African director um, of 2013. And perhaps this is the vision we had for uh, light therapy by now, 100 years later. Um, so here's a med bay. Um, that's a child with leukemia, where the light-based therapy in the med bay, OK, it's a movie, so they don't elaborate. Um, <laughs> is used to re-atomize, so to basically reverse engineer perhaps what we know the characteristic output of the division of cancer cells looks like, for example. Imagine some reverse engineering and then use as a therapy to completely heal a person. Um, Re-atomizing would presumably require some matter, or perhaps we really are converting light into matter in these systems. Um, but now we're in the realm of sci-fi. So this is another scene where they really re-atomize. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, so I think in the comments for the movie, there were some criticisms of what's the feedstock if you're producing atoms from scratch to restore someone's face, you know, presumably inputting some kind of material. But uh, science fiction, let's recall. <laughs> okay. And he's the bad guy, as I remember, so he wakes up. Okay. So you can watch the movie if you're curious to know the storyline. Um, but are we here yet? If not, um, when will we be? 
in a position where we can do holistic uh, diagnosis and therapy with biophotons. I'm not going to answer that question, but perhaps we can discuss that. Um, I think I've already been through been through these topics, but basically we are looking at the physical properties of biophotons. So we're measuring them, we're characterizing them, we're understanding them in more detail, but also their role and origin in biological systems, and furthermore in, in medical applications for therapy and diagnosis. Um, so here is the family tree. So on the left, we have people in the direct lineage of Alexander Gerwich there at the top. His daughter was instrumental in continuing his work after he passed away. And then Ilya is part of that lineage. He was, uh, um, his PhD supervisor was the grandson of Alexander. Um, and all of those speakers at the top, all of those, sorry, people at the top are connected in that publication. And the idea with the workshop with all of these people in the bottom present is to again connect all of these authors in a, in a publication on the topic. Um, so as I said, uh, his daughter was uh, instrumental in continuing his work, um, publishing for, for many decades, um, including reviews on the topic. So we do have access to frequent reviews through the years um, on the progress that has taken place. Um, and Lev Belusov, um, has been looking again at embryology and also at biophotons. And Ilya, we have heard from today, so feel free to ask him any detailed questions about the onion experiment. <laughs> We've heard about it in detail. Um, yeah, and in fact, uh, Ilya, so you've already participated in a 90-year review. So in fact, we just have now that we now that we have you, we just have 10 years to fill the gaps, <laughs> and then we are done with the century. Um, and we are we are honored also, along with Ilya, to have Masaki here, um, who really has contributed amazingly to visualizing um, the information present in biophoton emissions with a look towards healthcare in the future. Beautiful visualizations. You can visit his website if you'd like to see those in more detail. Here is an example. Um, and you may, this was taken from the website, so you may wonder why the fingertip would be glowing. So the oxidative damage that occurs from smoking is also visible um, through, through biophoton emission patterns. So you can get some idea how this is an indicator of health um, through looking at these kind of images. Edward van Beek has talked to us today, um, particularly also looking towards healthcare and disease. I think I've mentioned the more personalized healthcare systems and preventative healthcare um, being foremost um, and looking at how biophoton emissions can give us information on that. And this is a this is an interesting result. I'm not sure if you mentioned this afternoon because I had to pop out easily, but interestingly, meditation um, appears to reduce biophoton emissions, which implies um, is reducing the presence presence of free radicals and the kind of oxidative uh, stress results that can result um, when not meditating. So, um, inter an interesting paper you can read more on. But I guess evidence for the real health benefits of of meditation um, on a physiological level also. Um, and we had uh, Pavel speaking earlier. I've mentioned some of the some of the points that he had mentioned, and importantly, I think the, the seminal book on the topic, uh, which Pavel contributed to, will be a great resource for us as we as we look at tackling this paper along with the other people who will contribute. Um, so yeah, we are. These speakers will be speaking tomorrow. So in the interest of the discussion, um, I won't go into too much detail about what I imagine they will present on tomorrow. Um, quick glance. Um, and I should thank Bethany Adams, um, who's just recently finished her PhD on quantum effects in the brain, uh, who who got us talking about biophotons almost a year ago now, when we decided to think about hosting this workshop. Um, that in fact the the frequency of emitted photons. Um, is correlated with the complexity, perhaps, or intelligence, some might say, of different organisms. Um, we can chat to Bethany about that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so I think this was a, a great quote from Fritz, Fritz Albert Pop, um, that we are, we are beings of light, and there is a biofield associated with each and every living organism. Humans, maybe we focused on here, but I mentioned some examples of uh, insects or other other creatures that are also emitting this uh, luminescence that we are measuring in very uh, low intensities. Um, so we are, are all beings of light, 
Um, and when we go back to, to the Big Bang, we see this, this light and this matter has been around since the beginning of time, just reshaped into the organisms that we are today. And um, yeah, I think that's a beautiful conclusion to think about the unity of life on Earth and the ways in which light can, again, give us information on matter that can help us understand ourselves, understand our place in the universe, um, and also to provide healthcare. Uh, on a better level for all people on the planet and perhaps others. Thanks. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end it there, but the reason being that we can have some discussion now. So please feel free to ask any questions on Mars as well, which I didn't mention. Go ahead. <laughs> but uh, on biophotons also, we do have, as I said, we are delighted to have the leading experts from around the world here in the room with us. So thanks very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Adriana. And there is plenty of time for questions and, and, and comments. And also, I need to invite our online audience also to give some signs of life so that we can give uh, give them the opportunity to ask sure. questions. Anyone wants to start? Sorry? Oh. Ah, OK, OK. Sorry, it was probably too far away. Yeah. <clears throat> I usually don't earn my living singing. <laughs> Do you have a question? No. Here we go. I, I don't know. Thank you very much. This was very interesting. I've just now asking if this has been thinking about okay, so you are not including in here any thermal radiation. So it's not infrared, it's blue and violet. From what part of the body, you know, I think of a mice and uh, you know the animals. Um can it come so that it can actually you know, get to the outside, or how, how do we think about that? Is it emitted everywhere inside the body? Okay. Okay, good. Um, is it emitted everywhere in the body, wherever there are these um, reactions to oxygenated species? but we can only detect it on the outside, or do you think that some of the radiation from the inside can also, you know, from the brain, or it can be detected? Just to... I'll definitely refer people who know more, much more detail on this, so would anyone like to? I didn't mention that the the photo, the pictures or images I put up on the first slide are actually indications of circadian rhythm, which Masaki told us about. So at different periods of the day, the emissions would be stronger than at other periods. Um, those are those two images I showed. So it is predominantly around the head and certain other areas. But let me stop right there and open the open to the floor. Who would like to answer the question on which parts of the body? And uh, if we would have detectors inside the body, would we detect a different type of, of biophoton emissions? At the moment, we're stuck outside. So who's going to volunteer? <laughs> Maybe we should ask Edward with that because. So, would would anyone like to give us a brief overview on which which parts of the body, uh, what kind of processes? So, it's typically metabolic related processes, so electron transport chains, for example. Um, but please let me not butcher anyone's field. Uh, okay, uh, actually, all kinds of living cells emit biophotons because of the chemical reactions and because of the cellular metabolism. And uh, but what is detectable is from mostly from the surface, and especially from uh, if we start from the brain. Okay, there is a skull around it, and also skin, and also the hair. So for only some specific wavelengths, it is possible just to pass through. For example, below 600 nanometers, uh, it is not possible. And also from the, just if we uh, consider vice versa, also from the ambient light penetrating to the brain, just from the red light, just a, a small fraction of that can be detected, okay? And also we need a very high sensitive uh, uh, tools 
to detect this kind of photons. So from deep organs, if you intend to detect it's by a photon, it's better to be isolated. So it's not a good tool. But if your detecting device is uh, extremely sensitive for some wavelengths, just uh, a little bit deep inside for a couple of centimeters, it is possible, for example, in the range of red and near infrared, you can detect those kind of photons. Uh, yeah, but it, it is still uh, just uh, at the level of investigation. Um, but all kinds of living cells emit these photons. It depends on the, for example, even you can, uh, but uh, to diagnosis of cancer, maybe based on biopsy, um, you can do it. And also based on cell cultures, you can uh, study it. And so, for example, regarding reactive oxygen species, uh, just the detection of that with the other tools, maybe it's uh, really difficult, but based on photon detection, it would be easier. So it provides better possibilities for diagnosis of different abnormalities in cells and also diagnosis of diseases. It depends on the application. Yeah, we can investigate uh, just some kind of by photons and some of them are really difficult. So for deep tissues, it's still, I can say that uh, extremely difficult, yeah. Does that hold also the other way around? If you want to heal something with light? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a technique which is called photobiomodulation or uh, PBM. Uh, people are using for, for, for decades, they're using uh, some uh, light stimulation for different wavelengths. They're using, for example, on the head or some part of the body. And uh, it, uh, it can be a treatment for some kind of diseases. And people are not sure that how it works. But if you calculate the number of photons that come in, in just penetrates into tissue, maybe at some levels it reaches at the level of biophotons or just at some depths. And that maybe these two issues can be connected. So most of the research on biophoton is just based on diagnosis and based on basic research. What are the main sources? Uh, do these biophotons play any role in functional um, in biological functions, or they are just some byproducts? So what we can say that yeah, based on photobiomodulation, if we can make a connection, then it has some uh, therapeutic applications. I I would like to add something to to the first part of his uh, speech. It's actually uh if you take the body as it is and try to measure uh, by photons from it 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 is done and there are uh, very good publications of that from masaki and from edward but generally it's um like trying to uh, analyze what's inside there without actually knowing what it is you cannot you cannot put the photomultiplying tube inside your body uh, if the body remains alive, certainly. Um, so uh, the, for, for diagnostic purposes, what could be a good other attitude uh, would be to measure by photons from, say, blood, from, from other uh, liquids that you can take from the body without injuring. And actually, this was done... Uh, a lot was done in this respect at the very beginning in the Gurich's period of works. It was not actually one Gurich who was doing that. There were a, a couple of hundreds of people all over the world and uh, as we calculated, a thousand publications altogether. Uh, so uh, a good part of these publications were actually med medicine related and it's very hard to extrapolate it to the present day knowledge because this is just like speaking on in another language but still what they uh, showed or what they claimed i don't know what 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 verb to use was that uh, blood of healthy people of healthy 
uh, I don't know, young, active, etc. So it didn't, uh, it emitted uh, that mitogenetic radiation quite intensely. And blood of cancer patients did not. So that appeared a kind of good diagnostics. So we don't know how to use that now because they, they were using different attitude. They were not measuring photon emission with the help of physical devices. They were um, indirectly assassinated by biological effect, the mitogenetic effect. But still, they claimed that this method gave them very high accuracy in cancer diagnostics. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. It, actually, I don't know, I have, there's I have a, a question, question behind you. Uh, Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could just expand on, because you showed an image of um, RS damage on the fingers due to long-term cigarette smoking, um, but you also showed an image in prior, previous slides on the setup. I was wondering if you could just expand on like how would one do imaging to generate a result like that? Oh, thank you. <laughs> 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 for our image yes yeah, so it was so it was his images for the, the hand versus the, the the setup that can measure these kind of things on the basic so i i'm using the ccd camera but that is that has extremely high sensitive so it can see the single level of uh, weak light it so then even if we use such kind of equipment, the for one image we need uh, 15 minutes or something. So, if you want to see in the biophoto image of the human, you uh, you have to uh, in the dark room for 15 minutes without moving. <laughs> if if you want to try to see your biophoto, so please come to my laboratory in Japan. Volunteers. <laughs> Yes, and then also there was the delay, right, from being in the sunlight. You also need to sit in the dark room to prepare for the delayed luminescence that comes off of your skin yes, yes. as a result of the sunlight you recently absorbed. You wait for that. Then you sit still for even more. No, we had we had some discussions of 24 hours. No, that wasn't serious. Was it? <laughs> Please. I just jump. Oh, aha. So the setup shown up there is actually my setup, which is not looking at imaging. Oh, sorry, um, I didn't reference So there's it. lots of different types of um, uh, samples that you can measure um, and lots of different reasons why you want to want to look at them. So um, the imaging is done. There's lots of um, different people here who did different imaging. But um, in general, you, you've got a camera and it's, it's all about um, the sensitivity of it, as he said, you have to stay in the dark for 20 minutes before. One single image is 15 minutes. So it's like a long exposure. I don't know if you've ever taken pictures of the stars, but 15 minutes for a picture, you'll get streaks across the stars. So you need the people to be very still for, for when you're doing that. Um, when I'm looking at samples, I, I don't really care about the, the images or for, for the experiments I'm doing. I'm just trying to measure how the intensity changes over time. So because we're looking at these um, chemical reactions in the cells that are generating this light, it gives us an idea of how um, these reactions, which tell us about the state of the, of the life, um, progress over time. Um, whereas, or if you're looking at the imaging, you want to see where the reaction is in the cells happening more strongly. So, so all the cells in your body are, 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 are going through these reactions, but sometimes certain stimulus make them more intense at times than others. So if you've got damage, you're, you're, the cells will really try to repair it. So they're gonna be very active and they're gonna emit more light uh, because the repair process uses one of the techniques which gives off light. Okay, so so it's, 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 um, we've got some incredible experts that can tell you about if you wanna know a specific reaction, but um, yeah, that's kind of the general the general idea. You, you, wanna, you wanna look at this emission and you wanna choose some sort of experiment that lets you see that at incredibly low levels. Thanks, Alistair.
I have a question about uh, Mars and about biophotons. Um, so I've shown that reactive oxygen species can be, uh, well, the, the singlet triplet conversions can be modulated by external magnetic fields. Um, so if you're going to Mars where there's not much of a magnetic field, it's going to change your reactive oxygen like, con the balance of triplet and singlets. And that's going to have some, or well, should have some effect on your biophotons. So do you know of any of the space agencies that are actually using uh, biophotons to look at what happens to living organisms in magnetic fields and different magnetic fields? Anybody? Nice question, Bethany, bringing it all together. Um, yeah, I think the human presence so far has been limited to 20 years in the space station, which is actually still inside the Earth's magnetic field. So to do experiments beyond the Earth's magnetic field, um, you know, even the moon is to some extent still within the magnetic field zone. So our return to the moon in the next couple of years, maybe if we're on track, um, will also not afford the experimental setup to, to test for that. So completely uh, creating a, a room which is completely sealed from the Earth's obviously ambient magnetic field is probably difficult to set up if you're going to have someone living in there. I mean, thinking about how they're going to breathe, for example, yeah, there's a few issues. Um, so in particular, with, with my research, it was shown that photosynthesis in particular um, is impacted by external magnetic fields. Uh, even weak, even weak magnetic fields. So this was something I had proposed that we should, at least for agricultural production, start to test how plants grow without magnetic fields. Because in fact, it's known that during um, germination and various other periods during plant growth cycles, uh, putting in an uh, external magnetic field in the growth zone in the greenhouse can actually stimulate growth. Um, so while this is known uh, on a common sense level with some farming applications and while quantum biology is now investigating it, um, not enough work is being done, I think, on this quite critical question. Um, so I don't know of any experiments. Does anyone else? We could propose one and I'll, if anyone's aware of any experiments, go ahead. I mean, we, we are in touch with multiple companies that deliver technology and experiments to the space station. So NanoRacks is the one we, we're in touch with. So this this is a matter of piggybacking, as they call it now, and getting a free ride to the space station or to the moon with a simple setup. Um, it has to be remotely deployable. So, okay, not on the space station, but on the moon. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, in our lab in Canada, we are working on uh, the effect of magnetic field uh, on uh, radical pairs, reactive oxygen species, and also uh, delay luminescence and biophotons. Uh, the main reason is because uh, some radical pairs, based on their spin, they can be uh, affected by magnetic field. So by changing that, especially in, in the range close to the uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic field of the Earth in the hypomagnetic field, and uh, we see that there are some variations, and so the intensity can be affected by that. And so based on these, maybe we can find some, or we can explain some phenomena. So our group predicted uh, just, uh, they uh, built a model and uh, they predicted uh, some phenomena, for example, right, like circadian rhythm, and also for Anastasia, and also for some polymerization, the polymerization of microtubules, and uh, also some other mechanisms uh, that it is possible that based on the magnetic field, they can be uh, affected. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, this is just that the, 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 we are uh, at the first uh, step, uh, just uh, we will uh, publish our results maybe in, in a few months. Thanks. Yeah. Said, we look forward to that. And good, we have a section on a proposal then to send an experiment to the space stage. <laughs> yeah, well, so weak, weak magnetic fields are supposed to suppress triplet formation in, in certain contexts. So this would be interesting whether it can also induce health in some aspects. Yeah, no, nice question. Yes, experimental results. Because we are repeating the experiments to make sure that what we are observing is real, <laughs> because uh, it is affected. And uh, just by repeating on different species, different uh, biological samples to make sure that this is a real effect of magnetic field. 
Uh, the theoretical results, so uh, there's a Hamiltonian, that's the group of Christoph Simon. Uh, they are theoretician, part of uh, just our team. And there's uh, his students are working on the Hamiltonian and also some predictions. So we are just checking by experiment. We are the, from the experimental part, just checking what they predict, uh, 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 just the results that they uh, predicted by the model. Yeah. I have maybe a very silly question. Um, in the images we saw today, when they image the faces, there's never any uh, biophotons coming from the eyes. Is that because eyes have so many photoreceptors that they are mopping up all the excess uh, biophotons? Or... Okay. Uh, how do you know that they're not emitted from the eyes? It was in uh, one of the... Somebody meant... Is that I mean okay? Uh, just yeah, that's an interesting question, especially uh, because we have uh, we we have some phenomena in our eye. Just uh, before before understanding this phenomena in our, uh, in our eyes, uh, there's something uh, which is called dark noise. Uh, this dark noise can be in any kind of digital cameras. Okay, even on your cell phone when you take picture by different models of cell phone, you have different qualities, okay? So you can estimate just or measure the amount of noise in each of their models based on the properties of those pixels. Uh, also regarding our eye, we have two kinds of noises and it can be detected in the lab just by some simple experiments. Not so simple, but comparing with other experiments in neuroscience, uh, it seems simple. This is called continuous dark noise. Another one is called discrete dark noise. The continuous dark noise is a lower, uh, with, with a lower amplitude. So the amplitude is about 0.2 picoamperes. And we have a discrete dark noise, which has a higher amplitude, is a stronger. It is around one picoamperes. And they are continuously produced, but with a low rate in our eye. And they're spontaneous. And people cannot explain that why this happens, even based on the heat and temperature, or the biological temperature, and based on some distribution, which is called Boltzmann distribution and Arrhenius equation, people cannot explain it because the amount of energy is not. It's just. No, no, I'm talking about the noise, even if you just. Uh, isolate a single photoreceptor and put it in a small circuit, just in a circuit, and it produces this current. It's not just creation of the image. And um, sometimes maybe you don't sense it, that just you cannot feel it, okay? Thanks, Pavel. Are you hearing me? Okay, I mean, principally, eyes should provide high biophoton emission because inside of eyes, we have a lot of pigments. Yeah. Photoreceptors. Yeah, which contains uh, pigments, yeah. I mean that uh, why we are seeing images of biophotons of the face where in the eyes is no biophoton emission is really very interesting because there should be high photon emission, yeah, because we have a lot of pigments inside, yeah. I mean, this, this this can be explained by this photon absorption by photoreceptors, because we estimated this 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 amount of photon emission. Uh, just you know, the 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 retina layer, just a small part, just based on that, uh, the rate of biophoton emission from each centimeter square per second is in the order of few photons to one thousand photons. Okay, this is the rate of photon emission, and if you compare it with the rate of dark noise produced by each photoreceptor cells, and if you divide it by that cross-section of each photoreceptor, they can be almost the same. So we, we explained in one of the papers. I mean, but uh, you, what you say that, okay, why we don't observe it at all from imaging outside, so nothing is emitted, uh, this I don't know, but just on the other side, we detected that by a photon can be absorbed by photoreceptors. This is what we estimated. But on the other side, Okay, just some of them can be absorbed by photoreceptors, but what about the rest? This, this I don't know. Yes. 
Does anybody know? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so, again, this is not my speciality, but uh, I believe it's because um, you've, your eyes, isn't, there's not a lot of metabolic activity in the surface of your eyes. Um, can anyone maybe jump in on that? But you, everywhere else, you've got metabolic activity happening, but your eyes basically a giant lens with all the metabolic activity at the back of it. Uh, sorry, can I propose? Because um, as far as I understand, which is literally like Wikipedia levels, it's um, your when you see light, it's a cis trans, you know, tautomerization with the molecules or the receptors in your eyes that transfer trans yeah transfer chemical signals to electrical signals and instead of emitting it outwards it emits inwards to your brain so instead of releasing that photon to the photo detector or whatever photodiode outside the electrical signals go towards the brain which is internal and maybe that's why you don't measure it is that possible sorry everyone's looking at me like i'm crazy <laughs> Appar apparently there's debates on this so <laughs> thank you for your <laughs> input this is why we're here, after all, to flesh out. If these, if I can maybe comment, I mean, please. most of the emission will be in the near infrared, and your eye is essentially water, which will absorb a lot of that, so it just uh, won't get out of the eye. So if we have moist skin, does that also not show good emissions? Sweaty people in the dark room, do they look the same? <laughs> Maybe later at dinner with a glass of wine, the answer will appear magically. But I think we have, uh, since it's almost uh, five, we have a special question from two special participants. Please. Adriana, can I leave it? Yeah. Thank you. Did you guys think of questions already? Or should I play your video? Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is a bit, bit off the biophoton topic. Let me think for a moment. Yeah, there we go. I, I agreed to personally take the apparatus required to measure biophotons to Mars. So please work on making it as small and light uh, as possible um, <laughs> and robust to the kinds of radiation that we might expect on the surface of Mars unless we're living underground. Um, and in preparation for the expansion beyond Earth in our lifetime. So this is, this is a solid statement because we will return with a permanent presence to the moon if NASA's time frame stay the same in 2026. So I suspect they might delay a few years, but I think people living permanently on the moon is going to happen before 2030, I think. So that's exciting for you guys, because how old are you now? Nine and seven. Okay, so in 10 years' time, you'll be 19 and 17. And by then, when you're thinking about what you're going to do growing up, living on the moon could be one of your options. How cool is that? Okay, so we've already been to the moon, so going back is, you know, we need to do that first, good. But the next exciting part is to go beyond the Earth-Moon system, because the moon is our moon, it's part of the Earth. So if we want to expand beyond Earth, for whatever reasons they may be, exploration, adventure, uh, new science, a new understanding of society, and building a community from scratch in an extreme place, all sorts of reasons why we want to go to Mars, but for me it's basically about exploring and going on adventures to places where people haven't been before. So this is a video about the project, and you have to be 18 to apply, but maybe in 10 years' time when we're really training to really go on South African Elon Musk's rockets to Mars, we've got to start practicing. So how can we train on Earth for Mars? So Mars is an extreme place because it's very cold, you can't breathe the air, and there's no liquid water not on the surface anyway. So that's the reason we think of these three places, the desert where there's no water. So we will then focus on water management systems. If you've been around in Cape Town when we had all the water restrictions, imagine that, but like even worse on Mars, that's our little water we'll use. We'll recycle a lot of it. If we go to the polar regions like Antarctica or the North Pole, um, then we can practice in temperatures actually similar to Mars because Mars is cold, but not a lot colder well, on average, it's around the same as Antarctica. So if you've been to Antarctica, you've experienced the kind of cold on average that Mars has, around negative 60 degrees Celsius. And if you live under the ocean, that's a good place to practice for not being able to breathe the air. So there are places on Earth where we can practice, and not related to biophotons at this point, but here's a quick video. 
Oh, we don't have sound. But that's okay. We can look at the... Should I leave? Will it come through the speakers or through my laptop? Oh, okay, good. Uh, it's not letting advanced show sound. No, that option is grayed out again. I can try and remember what's going on. Okay. Okay, so this is this is just the preliminary voyages where I went to look at the extreme environments, cold places, so we can practice a negative 60, living under the ocean, so we can practice having to put on suits to be able to breathe, and going to the desert like Namibia, which is actually a great place to train for Mars. It looks kind of Martian, and there's not a lot of water, so we'll really practice uh, being very efficient with our water usage when we're there. So this is a call for people to join our team, people who are uh, excited to go on adventures, go to extreme places, and also be part of a community doing research and also living as a community and supporting each other um, in an extreme place um, in preparation to, to leave the planet. So if you have any, any questions on that, I can answer them while my stuff falls apart. <laughs> we can chat afterwards. Adriana, thank you very much for the talk. I think it was very successful because we recruited two Mars explorers. <laughs> yeah? and, and I hope we recruited also a few biophoton researchers, yeah? but uh, that we will find out maybe tomorrow. Yeah? So thank you very much, everyone.